Um, I think one, one kind of uh, undercurrent that runs through meetings like this is uh, what can academics really do? What do we do? What can we do? And I, and I think that there's a lesson to be learned from environmental justice as a movement in terms of how it changed the conversation about the environment. And I think in doing that, it becomes very important so that there are other voices that enter the fray. They don't have to come from one source. And I think that's very important. And that shows up here in terms of the, the different fields represented, certainly some people that are working in the policy arena as well. Uh, it's a frustration, I think. I know through my whole career, I've always thought of the present as the ground to which I was drawing my historical interests. And uh, I, I began being an environmental historian, studying garbage, and I'm still doing that. And it, to me, it was the most intimate environmental connector between people and their physical uh, world. So I'm thankful for, for that, th despite all the thousands of jokes that I've put up with over my time. So I'll turn this on. This is the official beginning. <laughs> um, in trying to come up with an idea, for this, and this is always daunting. I'm, I'm glad some of you stayed. You know, it's, uh, at the end, you're lucky if you get, you, you know, family members and a few others in the audience that aren't catching a train or, or so. Um, and, and it's hard to know what to do. Uh, and I, I think this presentation comes out of uh, my inability to really understand what kinds of inequality can legitimately be placed under the umbrella of environmental justice, and which can't. Uh, and wondering if there should be a distinction, if we should be concerned about those kinds of things. But uh, the way in which uh, any kind of movement evolves has a great deal of, uh, plays a great deal in, in making that kind of decision for you. So this, this paper, in some ways, is, is more of kind of a muse uh, than anything else. The question arises, has there been a broadening of the environmental justice frame since the 1980s? The easy response would be yes. That it now takes greater account of class and to some degree gender and has spread globally certainly raises some questions. Upon a closer look, the, the answer is not so simple. Environmental justice as a concept and as an action item, has neither developed uniformly nor in a linear fashion. Clearly, context, circumstance, and place matter. What those who adhere to the environmental justice frame share is a common consensus on very broad outcomes, more than on specific causes. And I think there's a big difference there. Almost all definitions are emphatic about people's rights to a clean environment. And many include a consequent protection and enforcement to ensure it, but do not necessarily suggest solutions, and certainly not common solutions. There are a lot of definitions. I had a lot of others on reflection. I should have brought a PowerPoint that listed all of them. But I'm just going to look at a couple. One that we're we're quite familiar with is the 1992 statement from the EPA that stated thusly, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, and national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And that was a, it's been challenged, it's been questioned, but it's something that, that resonated on high in, in Washington in some circles for a while. Uh, last year in, in the volume, uh, uh, a volume on environmental justice, uh, I think published by Rutledge, uh, Professor of Environmental Politics, Brendan oh, Colsey, fleshed out the definition a little more. Environmental justice for all means a true and honorable place for all peoples that acknowledges, honors, and respects their environmental context histories, heritages, and identities such that no community is ever labeled as powerless or disposable or forced to endure a real, uh, reality whereby its members are made to experience themselves in that way. 
So it, 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 in substance, probably is not much different, but certainly a texture uh, is. And there are others that, are, that diverge from that somewhat. Yet the Declaration of Environmental Justice as a necessary goal for the burgeoning environmental movement emerged out of activism, not academic query. As historian Christopher Wells noted, uh, <clears throat> the rising blind spots of the maturing environmental movement, environmental justice emerged largely as a critique of the nation's narrow environmental commitments. As we know, beginning in the 1980s, environmental justice advocates reinvigorated the demand for civil rights in a new political arena. They focused on the disproportionate exposure to health and pollution risk faced by people of color at home and in the workplace. The goal of the environmental justice movement was urban focused and essentially political, directed at the government, at private industries, and what they believed to be a white middle class dominated environmental movement more interested in nature preservation than human health and well-being. The earliest literature on environmental movement, uh, environmental justice topics, uh, also reflected these goals and was clearly polemical. You could find very few things, studies that were not. Uh, and I guess that makes sense given the, the time when uh, those books are, are uh, written. Uh, Gordon Walker, who is at the Lancaster Environmental Center, stated, as one of the most significant developments in contemporary environmentalism, environmental justice has become increasingly used as part of the language of environmental campaigning, political debate, academic research, and policy making around the world by bringing attention to, quote, previously neglected or overlooked patterns of inequality which can matter deeply to people's health, well-being, and quality of life. Such incendiary terms as environmental racism and more clinical academic definitions such as environmental equity were set aside in the early days of the environmental movement, the environmental justice movement, and placed, uh, replaced by the concept of environmental justice as a more politically viable rallying point. It offered a more positive, more inclusive concept to interject into the political discourse and suggested a broader objective, that being justice, that simply, than simply the eradication of, of uh, racist action. But to many environmental justice advocates in the United States, eradication of racism was the central goal. Attempts to link pre-1980s grassroots anti-toxic activ activism uh, led by whites, such as Love Canal, which you've heard about and know about, uh, to the environmental uh, justice movement has been held at a distance. Some saw common causes, but others argued that they could identify many, quote, black love canals that never did get the mass media attention that love canal received. But I should mention that it's also true that although earlier grassroots protests, no matter what color, did not get mass media attention either. Uh, so there is kind of a historical dissonance here that is interesting. Uh, Eileen McGurdy, who's, who's written about North, uh, North Carolina, in some ways explains this when she stated, pinpointing an origin does not imply that a social movement is unrelated to prior events, but emphasizes that a radical change in the collective identity and movement strategy occurred. While efforts of environmental justice advocates sometimes met with skepticism and resistance, the connection of race to environmental concerns could not be ignored in any debate over pollution and health risk from that point forward. Even as the definition of environmental justice broadened to include a wider array of people of color besides African Americans, including Latinos, Pacific Islanders, uh, Native Americans, and others, Concerns over poverty, class, and gender remain linked to race. In an interview in March 2018, not too very long ago, Robert Bullard still insisted 
that to fight for the environmental justice cause, especially at the government level, advocates in the United States could not backpedal from the assertion that race is deeply intertwined in the problems, lest their argument get severely diluted by more broadly generalized causes of injustices. He asserted, race trumps class when it comes to pollution. There are still people who think you can see all races in the same way when we talk about the environment, but it's simply not the case. Some communities have the wrong complexion for protection, and that's not just a bumper sticker. And Bob is kind of a rascal kind of a guy, so you can kind of hear this in his, in his voice as he's, he's saying these things. Uh, such an argument keeps attention in the political arena on the grim and real problem of systemic racism in the United States, but in some ways runs up against the definitions of environmental justice which suggest <coughs> more universal and uh, aspirational goals. And I think it's important to really emphasize aspirational goals because I think that the, the, uh, the political decision uh, to uh, deal with these serious issues in this way had to include an aspirational goal or else I don't think they would have been heard as broadly or accepted as broadly. There's many people who might resist, but there are others I think that were not as threatened by that kind of a presentation than the concept of environmental racism, which was, I think, in your face to some people. So it was, it was a decision uh, with, with a purpose. While the convergence of civil rights protests and environmentalism opened a new phase in the environmental history of the nation, the political objectives of the environmental justice movement quickly exposed limitations in addressing broader issues than race. Some critics questioned whether empirical evidence demonstrated an overrepresentation of minorities and the poor in communities with hazardous facilities or cited contradictory results and inconsistent conclusions. Was it possible that others besides minorities and the poor could be unfairly exposed to environmental hazards? Uh, Christopher Foreman, sometimes referred to as the anti bullard when uh, he wrote his work, uh, an African-American man uh, who wrote kind of important critiques of environmental justice, asserted, analysis did not trigger activism. Rather, activists needed analysis to bolster their case. And I think that's fair. It doesn't, it doesn't suggest it's it, in any way unimportant. It kind of suggests the, uh, the temporal way in which uh, these ideas kind of came uh, to the public. What about the significance of class? We have people like NYU law professor Vicki Dane, uh, most notably, and others uh, who argued uh, that class, and then others came up talking about gender as well, uh, talked about how they affected inequality. And it became a big point of discussion and debate, asking whether we really can exclude class issues when we're talking here. Uh, Bullard had said earlier in his own work that, that when we're talking about the North Carolina case, so we're not talking about a class of black people, we're talking about black people in every economic stratification. So it was, it was difficult to maneuver around these kinds of questions and a fear that, they, that some people might paint themselves into a corner. And so the definitions were all kind of expanding and, and, and contracting. Environmental justice advocates did not dismiss class and gender as variables in environmental risk, but many, initially at least, gave them a lesser status than race. Later class and gender were added to most definitions in the United States, but most often within the context of race as the most important indicator of discrimination. There are some exceptions in the study of Packingtown in Chicago Soviet uh, Hood Washington viewed African American and poor European immigrants stuck in the same environmental predicament in the back of the yards in Chicago. She didn't make that distinction. She really looked at what was happening to them as people, and she made the distinctions in who was there, but definitely that was uh, a slightly different uh, take than others. Despite controversy surrounding the environmental justice movement in the United States, there's little doubt that it has forced recognition of environmental goals and objectives 
also by making clear that environmental risks affect different groups of people in disproportionate ways. It also stresses the need for us to understand that environmental values and perceptions are culturally constructed, and this has become kind of the tenet of most all, certainly environmental history work, and it is, it is vantage point. We need to understand uh, many of these issues from the vantage point of, uh, of different groups. The continued insistence on the centrality of race in the American uh, environmental justice movement can be explained in part by what Walker argued, quote, environmental justice is situated and contextual, grounded in the circumstances of time and place, hence defying universal definition, although common and recurrent elements do exist. This also is true as environmental justice becomes and became global. A variety of, quote, alternative visions and alternative versions of the environmental justice frame emerged in other parts of the world. In the United Kingdom, for example, environmental justice arrived uh, in some respects through more mainstream groups, uh, in one case, the Friends of the Earth, uh, being uh, activists of, of, of environmental justice, rather than through grassroots or civil rights uh, movement. In South Africa, on the other end, uh, because of the many parallels with, parallels with anti-apartheid struggles, there are common threads with American people of color. So there is great variety in these different contexts. In the book, Environmental and Social Justice in the City, Historical Perspectives, which was written in 2011, or published in 2011, I should say, uh, by editors uh, Jean-Vierre massard Guibault and uh, Richard Roger. Uh, Richard was in, uh, in Leicester at the time, uh, in England, and uh, Jean-Vierre was either back in Paris then or in the center part of France. I never can remember where she was at the time. But they were both uh, urban environmental scholars that put together a collection of essays uh, built around uh, uh, some of the themes that, that we would identify as environmental justice. Uh, they, they wrestled with uh, the major differences of environmental justice as defined in the United States and in Europe at the time as they saw them. The focus was on the difference in emphasis between inequality, which becomes really kind of a singular idea that they were espousing in the book, and injustice. And they state that pretty clearly. The editors stated, for example, indeed it has become obvious that the issues of social justice, human right, and environmental quality of life are inextricably linked. Initially, the differences were not so obvious, they said, quote, but we soon discovered that these semantic issues go uh, far beyond disciplinary habits. It reflects a perception of the environment that differs from one country or culture to the other. The issues of interest to Massard Guibault and Roger and their authors grew out of the American environmental justice movement, but race was not the primary focus in, continental, in the continental Europe setting, at least in terms of how they were dealing with the topic. More attention focused on environmental approaches versus ecological approaches, and this brought into question kind of non-human issues in relation to the question of justice. I think it's a really important one. It has barely been addressed within the context of environmental justice, but this becomes uh, kind of a larger debate point, not only at their meeting, but in France and other places uh, that were picking this up. Um, in, in some way. A replacement of environmental justice with the concept of social justice, more neutral and devoid of racial connotation, was often more common in Europe at the time. I went to a lot of meetings and, uh, uh, that used the term environmental justice within the context of not the colonial setting of a country, but within the, uh, the, the continental European setting. It's happened, in, I can remember, mostly in in Munich, and we were talking about this, and, and it, it didn't bring into question uh, the, the colonial questions that really do fit into maybe an American frame a little easier than what's happening in, in white continental uh, Europe. Uh, and the fact that if environmental justice terminology was used at all, it came from the top down rather than from the grassroots, and it was also in terms of kind of governmental at whatever level 
uh, policy. In several respects, as sociologist uh, J. Timmons Roberts argued, a wide range of struggles by non-U.S. communities against corporate or government polluters are being recast as environmental justice struggles for various reasons and with varying results. Is this a matter of co-opting a vivid concept, trying to broaden its reach, or tapping into its aspirational quality? I think mean, these are questions that are worthy of, of being asked. The editors of a recent uh, Rutledge Handbook of Environmental Justice came out I think last year, uh, try to reconcile an apparent gap between interpretations of environmental justice by asserting the following. Environmental problems from water and pollution to biodiversity loss and global warming have the capacity to affect all of us. However, as the Flint water crisis and other contemporary struggles so starkly remind us, they do not affect us all equally or in the same ways. Nor do we have equal power to decide solutions to these problems or to take the necessary action to solve them. This unequal and differentiated positioning which typically places the heaviest environmental burdens upon marginalized, disadvantaged, and less powerful populations, forms the central premise of the problem of environmental injustice and the hope for environmental justice as its solution. This definition su suggests that we now, fo quote, now focus on almost everything that is unsustainable about the world but that the terminology resisted straightforward definition. We now have energy injustice, we now have transportation injustice, we have housing injustice, we have climate injustice. We've heard about several of these in the past few days. The editors of the handbook rightly asked, quote, with this expansion of meaning, the question of justice for whom has also become more complicated. They also are right in asserting that the terminology has spread spatially and evolved temporally. It has taken on new political meaning, embracing even more issues and aspirations depending on the particular context. This is why I believe that we need historians, especially and especially more historians uh, who are people of color, uh, uh, of which there are very few in environmental history. The topic has expanded well beyond uh, the repopulation of the field with people uh, uh, in various parts of that category. Uh, to have historians, particularly not only historians, but those with a historical perspective, I should say, that's fair, to develop cases that establish more specific circumstances for understanding environmental injustices. We've seen some of that here, good examples of that. Uh, upon completion of, uh, of my recent book on Fresh Kills Landfill in 2020, um, I found it difficult to explain why this site was not just another NIMBY problem, writ large, certainly, but likely, uh, likely <clears throat> and, and I really thought maybe likely an environmental justice problem, despite the fact that the landfill, which is 2,200 acres in size, and situated in the middle of a salt marsh in Staten Island, New York, in 1948 and remained open until 2001, after 2002, uh, amongst a population of mostly white middle class people, but people without any knowledge of, of it being placed there or any input once it was there or the ability to eradicate it. And this, over a 50 year period, became a, a monumental political issue on the island itself. It helped actually prepare, propel Rudy Giuliani to become mayor of New York. Uh, and he promised that he would get rid of, uh, he would close the landfill, which he did, but in doing so created uh, additional problems. Uh, but that's a story for another day. Um, and it was a different Giuliani in some respects, or maybe not, I don't, I don't know. Um, part of the story that I tell within this larger story of Fresh Kills, what's going on, in the rest of the boroughs, uh, once the idea that the landfill was going to be closed, and one of the, the big issues, I think, and, uh, and a fair question to, for, for the spectator about is, the other boroughs were not happy 
to the landfill was closed because all of a sudden the responsibility fell upon them individually. Manhattan had, had done nothing. The Bronx and, and Brooklyn, uh, more so. Long Island, nothing at all. And now all of a sudden it became a, a borough issue. And that and Staten Islanders knew that, and they, they felt that uh, it was time that they stood up and did something about it. In the midst of that, in March of 1999, before the, the, the landfill actually closed, White House and other federal officials came to New York City to determine if transfer stations located in the South Bronx, and if you don't know what a transfer station is, uh, when you get the, the, the waste from the streets or wherever, you bring it to a central location. And so these are called these are transfer stations. And in New York, they existed throughout the boroughs, except in Manhattan, of course, <laughs> in Brooklyn and Bronx. And invariably, they were always in, in poor neighborhoods or uh, neighborhoods of people of color, with the exception of uh, a few that were in the Hasidic Jewish neighborhood uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, uh, this was a kind of a multi-class neighborhood. So it's different. They all end up fighting on the same side. Uh, so anyhow, they, they, they were determined if these, uh, if these transfer stations, uh, specifically them located in South Bronx, but later including uh, parts of, of Brooklyn, uh, and these were, were being blamed for causing widespread respiratory and other health problems. And the other issue, and someone brought up uh, the kind of transportation issue, it increased the number of trucks in the area by a major factor. And they had a big debate whether they were gonna ship the stuff out by rail or by truck. And, but in the meantime, there's trucks going all over the place. And then plus that, there's trucks going into New Jersey carrying New York waves uh, on a regular basis. So you have this increased traffic which was a danger to these communities on a greater scale than anywhere else in the city. Uh, and, and despite that, then, and, and again, the reason why these uh, officials were there, uh, because th th this evidence of, of health risk in neighborhoods that were predominantly African-American and, and, and Latinx. This was the first inquiry of its kind in the state of New York. About 50 officials, sponsored by the White House Council of Environmental Equality and led by representatives from the EPA and the Department of Justice, took a bus tour of the South Bronx and parts of Brooklyn, visited transfer stations, and talked with locals. Similar inquiries were going on at this time in Louisiana, Michigan, and elsewhere. So this was kind of some of the first efforts to take that changing legislation during the Clinton administration and put it on the ground in some, in some way. Congressman Vito Fasella, uh, and this is almost a stereotype because uh, Staten Island was a huge Italian-American population, was make, made it a lot easier for me to do research to tell you the truth because when I went there, they thought I was one, one of their own, so that, made, that helped. Uh, Fasella, who is a conservative uh, a representative from Staten Island, uh, was not pleased with the tour, nor the hearing that took place at Columbia University about what was going on in, in those neighborhoods. And he, he said, I find it outrageous that they convened a meeting with all these high level officials and they didn't come to see the city's worst environmental nightmare, the Fresh Kills landfill. He also rejected the notion that environmental justice should focus only on communities of color, adding, quote, I believe that this country stands for equality for all. If something adversely affects someone, it doesn't matter if they're black, Hispanic, or white. If it's bad for one, it's bad for all. And someone does go on, and he does clarify his remarks and said, I don't have anything against what they're doing in the Bronx and Brooklyn. I think they should be doing that. So he, he wasn't being, uh, he wasn't blinded to the issues himself. He just felt that not being included was a problem. Later on, there would, there would be representatives sent to Staten Island, but it was done in a really official capacity. I think they called Al Gore and wanted him to come visit or something. Uh, so there was this, this sense of, uh, of a disparity that was on. But Staten Island was never made part of the federal government's justice program. Uh, I wrote at the time, and in, in trying to deal with this in the book, I just, you know, it was not my major theme, it was one thing I was trying to kick around. I wrote at the time as a way of explaining the disparity 
Now, the government program in those days defined environmental justice strictly in, envi in racial terms. This was the executive order. This was the focus of, of what the environmental justice movement was able to, to do, do to convince some level of change in the government. Uh, and so I said, quote, uh, for good reason it was so, fairly or unfairly, it was difficult to make an argument that siding the landfill on predominantly white Staten Island could violate the civil rights of the majority population. Yet, I remain bothered by the act that the local circumstances on Staten Island seem to meet, in broad ways at least, what respected leaders of the environmental justice movement have used to define the movement itself. So we look at some of the things that sociologist uh, uh, Paul Mo Mo Mohai said during the Flint water crisis uh, in 2004, 2006, and he was a member of the Civil Rights Commission. He was also uh, talking about something very much in his, his own backyard uh, and talking about the injustices about the Flint water crisis that occurred. Uh, he uh, discussed it on three levels that we're kind of familiar with if we look at uh, the environmental justice uh, frame. One was the question of distributive injustice, where a concentration of poor people, people of color, suffer in a space that also suffers from contamination. And secondly, procedural injustice, in which residents are not given a meaningful voice in the decisions that impact their community. And thirdly, social justice, where problems are embedded in a large social context beyond the event itself. Obviously, fresh kills was not a racial issue, and the general proposition of social injustice might not apply, or not clearly apply for sure, but risk was distributed unequally, and the residents, while constantly protesting, were never given a fair hearing. They had very little to do with the decision. The decision was purely political. It was purely a way of getting votes. Giuliani had won Staten Island in the previous election, against David Dinkins, <clears throat> and still lost. Dinkins had gathered a mass more votes in the other boroughs. Uh, but this time, the number of voters in Staten Island had increased dramatically over that period, and that made the difference. It also made the difference in the election of George Pataki, who was governor of New York, and also uh, the, uh, the major commissioner uh, on Staten Island. And the convergence of those three officials, who were all Republicans, they came together and realized it was politically advantageous to close the landfill, although from a practical point of view, it was really a dumb decision. And what New York ended up doing was transferring all of its waste out of state and making everybody angry all along the periphery of the city. <laughs> and it proved not to be a very good solution. The bureaus themselves were unwilling to take up the burden. Uh, but in any event, it, it, had, it had broader reverberations uh, certainly later on. But from an environmental justice point of view, to this day, I'm still struggling with how do I deal with this? How do I explain it in a way uh, that uh, that might be fair? Uh, the Fresh Kills controversy, of course, did not fit neatly into to Mohai's calculations, but neither did events like Love Canal and even Flint. One observer of the Flint water crisis made the claim that what happened in Flint was not due to racial disparity because water had been consistently devalued by the government in Michigan. Rural people had suffered as much as urban residents. Quote, the poor, whether rural or urban, suffer disproportionately when their valuation of resources is not considered. Now, was this a fair argument? Was it specious? Was it tortured? I mean, you know, it's hard, hard to know. Somebody was trying to make it in order to, for whatever, whatever ends. I guess to see that this was a, a longer uh, and more complex problem than it uh, happened to be. Uh, the Michigan uh, Civil Rights Commission remarked uh, at several points in its 2017 report that, quote, implicit bias was clearly evident in the Flint case and throughout the country at large. But it added the racialized outcome experienced in Flint also had white victims. For the white families who remained in the city and did not flee to the suburbs were, quote, victims of racism by association. And uh, this was uh, a small part of a much larger report that, that really talked about systemic racism in the case of Flint, which is, is pretty obvious. Uh, 
I don't think it makes sense to seek a universal definition of environmental justice. I think based on a lot of the exceptions, it's, I don't think it's fair uh, to do that. Uh, what the original founders of the movement and those that followed have made clear is that environmental risk and injustice are in most cases not random acts, but systemic, and those most seriously affected need to voice I need a voice in, in moving uh, toward a sustainable and healthy future. More empirical studies, not just broad generalities, will help make those points more emphatic and possibly more nuanced, although also more complicated and confusing. But that's what we do oftentimes as scholars. Uh, and we don't have good answers, we're not journalists. Uh, we also, I will dig at our speakers, they've been stuck the needle in about the history of not having much of a, a role in the public. We don't, but we don't need to be reminded of it all the time. Uh, we also have to uh, be careful not to turn environmental justice into sloganism, or use the term so broadly that it renders it ambiguous or overgeneralized. For example, the idea that, quote, racial justice is climate justice, or, quote, there is no climate justice without racial justice speaks an important aspect of justice questions, but might blur some large, uh, larger and complementary issues. It's become increasingly clear, of course, that repercussions of climate change will target certain people differently than others. Those living along coastal areas where sea level rise has, has become threatening, uh, com uh, combined with the difficulty or inability of the, of the least advantaged citizens to seek out and find other places to live inland uh, certainly is is an issue and, and obviously speaks to this, this differentiation even with something like climate change. The major shifts in the weather certainly can force agricultural activity to migrate and disrupt the lives of workers, among others. There is, however, also a, a kind of universality of climate change effects, which the majority of people in the world will commonly share. And that has to be worked into our equation as well. The most difficult aspect of the environmental justice frame is not calling attention to injustices, but finding ways to rectify them. Such is a daunting task. Thank you.